Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, exactly on time. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the most incisive and comprehensive presentations uh, in Thailand that we've heard in Thailand on the AIB. AIB is a window. You know, it's just a window. It's a, it's a function. It's a component. It's a window to understand China's larger aims. Larger aims. So I have a few um, uh, questions I want to just uh, throw into the, the pot and then while I invite uh, the, the discussions up here. But you know, you mentioned the US is out, but Japan is also not, not in. Uh, that's uh, conspicuous. Two years ago, there was some talk in Washington that uh, Japan would, would join first and the US would have to be last because otherwise Japan would lose big face you know, to join last. But uh, that has not happened yet. And now I think the, the mood in Washington and the United States is not going to be conducive for joining the AIB at all. Um, and the big question about your presentation is that, you know, is this a part of China's grand strategy? Does China have a grand strategy? Uh, you know, what, what do they really want? Is, are they a revi revisionist kind of uh, superpower? Do they want to change the whole rules and, and the regional framework, or they, do they just want to complement it? Maybe uh, tinker a little bit, add to it, uh, this so far, th there's some cooperation, these projects, just a handful, but they work with IFC, World Bank, so that's, uh, that's encouraging that they're not trying to replace the existing system, they're actually working with it. Um, and other issues, like, uh, you know, I met uh, uh, Mr. President Jin Lishunt uh, one time, and, uh, you know, so, so much of the AIB is dependent on him. Uh, he, he is an AIB guy, uh, but beyond him, I don't know what uh, kind of people they have to, to look after the, the AIB. Um, uh, criteria, standards, uh, you mentioned at the end about sustainability. So let me invite uh, uh, our speakers here. Look, uh, Ms. Uh, Luis uh, Julieta Rio Licard, please uh, just take your seat on the, on the panel. Um, Joe Horn, Patano Tai, uh, Jim Stent, Kim um, And while they're doing that, uh, we see that. Uh, AIB goes along with hand in hand with OBOR. And there's also the NDB, the New Development Bank. So th these are really the key China drivers uh, you know, on the fluid global canvas. So to help us understand, tease out some of the insights, I have a pleasure of, uh, uh, let me just, uh, you have all the bios. So let, let me first begin with uh, uh, Mr. Luis Julieta Rio Lichard, which. Um. Thank you, Mark, for providing some inroads to my input and sharing. And uh, thank you, Mr. Dr. Titinan, for the introduction on our president. You see, I'm a Filipina, so I know the insides of what is going on in my country. And thank you for uh, the sponsors and for everyone who are present here. Um, I'm Luz and I am the AIIB coordinator in the NGO Forum on ADB. NGO Forum on ADB has been uh, holding the bank, Asian Development Bank, accountable for 22 years now. So what I'm going to talk about is more my experience or our experience on ADB and how we see it again coming up in the uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Bank. So I'm here more to raise the other side of the coin. So it's not just the need for infrastructure, but for who are these infrastructures for? So it's a civil society perspective and the demands for more responsible investments. Uh, a good question to ask, aside from what Mark has already mentioned, because she, he kept uh, he was talking more of uh, organizational and the implications on the geopolitics. Who are the actual beneficiaries of these projects? In the end, we should actually start looking at the faces behind these projects, the countries that will be affected. So let me go on now. As Mark has mentioned, there is no doubt a need for infrastructure. Uh, financing. There seems to be a big gap that is going on. This is, uh, I will be focusing more on the Asian part. So Asian infrastructure market is expected to grow by 7%, they say, over the next decade, approaching 
5.36 trillion annually by 2025, representing nearly 60% of the world's total. Asian infrastructure investment increased between 2009 to 2013, accounting for more than 50% of the global increase in capital spending. In order, they say, to maintain this current level of economic growth, Asia will need to spend approximately $8 trillion. And in order to sustain this growth, it will, it will have to inject between $800 billion and $1.3 trillion annually into the infrastructure projects between now and 2020. This reflects growth in China's spending, whose share of global infrastructure spending is expected to rise from 22% in 2012 to 30% in 2025. We see that Chinese finance mostly in infrastructure is extractive. So you see there the transportation, hydropower, mining, and all those stuff. So far, I think uh, Mark mentioned about the projects that have been approved already, and uh, two of which we are now monitoring. One which was approved in September 2016, it's, a, uh, it's, it's this uh, project in Pakistan, which is co-financed with the World Bank. And the recently one in Myongyan, which is a co-financed by uh, IFC and ADB. And it's a gas turbine power plant also. It's very important to note that even before, or the Myongyan project was approved even before the energy policy was out or approved. So w what does it mean to us? So projects that are already undergo, uh, being un approved and being uh, undertaken even before a clear policy guidelines on how to handle these projects. Now, there are several other projects. I think M Mark mentioned them already. You have the Bangladesh, which is a standalone project the Pakistan, the Tajikistan, the Indonesian projects. Now, this is an example of a corridor in Pakistan that they intend to do. It's called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. You will see that most of it will be coal, hydro, there will be solar and wind. There will be routes also uh, that will be built around it. So this is how they have divided, or at least, in the corridor, how it will look like already. So they are being uh, built all around. So what's wrong with these infrastructure projects? As Mark has mentioned as well, infrastructure development projects and investments are seldom politically neutral and not necessarily economically beneficial. This is especially the case of for fr fragile and conflict-affected countries where many of them have weak and absent systems of governance. That is why w one of the things that you will notice in most of the uh, policies ADB has, and now with the AIIB, they keep emphasizing the country systems. So they say that the beneficiary country will be the one to determine how the projects will have to be implemented. But you see, in cases where there's a weak governance and a weak country system, it really creates more problems there. This is especially the case, uh, two single-minded economic and investment this driven decision making is less concerned with, with externalities related to the use of natural resources, inclusive growth, and impacts to societies and communities. So all in the name of progress and development, com governments would usually just take on the uh, uh, money or the, the investment without consideration of the actual situation of the country. The, the, what I'm going to share now are some of the projects uh, we were able to uh, sort of monitor as the ADB is. So several projects that have been deemed unsuccessful as far as the ADB projects are concerned. We have the Kulna, this is the Bangladeshi project, which has caused landlessness and drainage problems in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with the Namthun project in Laos? This has displaced a lot of communities 
and compensations were not given properly to the communities. Then of course in India, you have the Tata Mundra coal plant, which has affected the my, my Muslim communities. And who will ever forget the trage tragedy that it has caused at the Mark Copper Mining Company in the Philippines? Up to now, some carabaos have lost already their uh, nails <laughs> because of the water, uh, the dirty water that have been coming out of the mining company. The latest is the 10-year uh, plight of the Khmer people on the railway re rehabilitation project. And it has displaced around 4,100, 4,164 4, 4, families already. Now, there are more specific projects I want to raise over here. As the case with these projects, the West City Hydropower Project in Nepal, where is the issues were constitutional and legal, they were not really properly uh, consulted. Policy violations of the Asian Development Bank, displacements and electricity benefit sharing and the downstream benefit of the project. We also have another way, another one, which is the railway project in Cambodia, wherein, as I mentioned, there are 4,029 households that are affected, loss of land and structures. This is one of the key things that we have been noticing. A lot of public lands or lands are being bought out already. Uh, so the commodification of land, meaning the, the communities are being displaced so that they can use the, the land for setting up the projects. Damages to female-headed, handicapped, and low-income households, compensation delays in indebtedness, community disintegration and disharmony with the host community, and intimidation. That is also another thing we have noted. There are more human rights violations wherein communities are being uh, the presence of military around the project areas. What are the real truths behind these infrastructure projects? There is massive displacement, forced resettlement, militarization and policing of development mega projects and not the people, the structure, destruction of the natural environment and life supporting ecological systems, loss of customary rights over land, natural capital and livelihoods for labor, violence and death. Multi-dimensional societal impacts of, to women, disabled, chi disabled children, of course, the LGBT, and all vulnerable groups, including the indigenous peoples, especially the indi indigenous peoples. In that case, I would like to pose this question, as Mark has made some of his own conclusions. What are the hard truths to face? Who are the real beneficiaries of these investments? looking at the AIIB's direction right now. Who are being excluded? What is Asia's real needs in energy and infrastructure in order to contribute to reducing poverty? Is it really reducing to, uh, contributing to the reduction of poverty? What country safeguard systems are in place to ensure that countries and their constituencies are getting the real benefits of these projects? Where can current policy frameworks for international financing institutions make a difference in actually addressing poverty from their infrastructure and inver energy investments. As an AIA, uh, as a key uh, civil society, uh, as an organization uh, having 222 constituencies coming from Central Asia, Mekong, South Asia, and as well as the Southeast Asia, these are some of the concerns that we are raising right now environmental and social safeguards. AIIB has a list of prohibitive uh, uh, investment lists that they have included. Accountability mechanisms that are still very much biased. Public communications that lack transparency. As of now, they have the public information interim policy, which has uh, still has not given any concrete uh, uh, way by which information can be accessed by everybody. Another is that there is a resident or non-resident board structure. Um, uh, this is part of uh, AIIB's claim that they want to be lean, so they don't have 
a, very, a, a, a single office, but right now they are uh, working from Beijing. The customary rights to land and national sovereignty, sustainable development approach, human rights, labor rights, rights of women, rights of indiv indigenous peoples, and the rights of LGBT also. And with that, I hope I have brought in, that's, that's my major contribution to this forum, to bring in the voice, at least, for us to consider when we do think about how uh, AIIB and China is contributed contributing to the new global order to think about what I've, I've raised over here in relation to the communities who are supposed to be the real beneficiaries of the projects. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luis. Uh, that's very helpful. So, you know, when we see numbers float around the infrastructure needs of Asia, it's always multi-trillion. It's always multi-trillion. It's like a black box. I don't know what are they talking about. Uh, in this case, 15 trillion, 8 trillion, but the point here, there are two points, I think. If you unpack the, the black box, you know that, uh, as Mark mentioned earlier, that uh, not all of them uh, are bankable, profitable, and not all of them will be built. And those that will be done will have the concerns that uh, Louis just mentioned about the uh, sustainability, appropriateness, um, you know, environmental concerns, uh, and so on. So very complimentary, your, your, um, your points. Uh, let me move to our uh, local discussions. Uh, so I, I begin first with uh, Joe Horn Patano Thai. I've known Joe for many years. He spends uh, probably more time in China than in Thailand, travels a lot. Uh, he comes from a finance, uh, banking, uh, corporate finance, uh, M&A uh, background, but now does uh, his own consulting with uh, uh, many entities and firms uh, between Europe, Asia, China, and uh, he's just someone from the from the ground, from the field, uh, who can really tell us about uh, what we should think, how we should interpret all these various Chinese vehicles and ventures. Um, also, you know the the sustainability of the Chinese domestic economy, and all the distortions that we read about. Uh, what do we make, uh, what should we make of AIB in the broader context of China's dream, intentions, grand strategy, John? Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to be here to, uh, to talk about these issues. Firstly, Mark, excellent work on your, on your paper. I enjoyed reading it very much. Uh, so I'd like to you know, give the, the kind of the business perspective, the deal makers uh, perspective on, on you know, what this whole OBOR, AIB kind of uh, fits into to, 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 you know, the bigger picture of where China is going over the next uh, decade or two decades. Uh, to put it into context, I, the way I, I see Chinese outbound investment, I, I split it into three phases. Uh, the first one, uh, basically before 2003, 2004. Uh, there was very little of it. Uh, there was a little bit of dabbling, you know, CITIC was in, in the region, uh, China Resources, you know, the, my office building, all seasons, it was built uh, with China Resources money. Uh, CITIC was here already in the 80s, but very, very little. And by and large, rather unsuccessful. Um, then you had, after 2004, uh, essentially the opening up of the, the, the restrictions, but also even before then, there was this need for China to go and secure resources. And between then, I'd say maybe for the next decade following that, it was the period of utilitarian acquisitions. They went out because they needed the oil, they needed the minerals, they needed, but also distribution, brands, technology. So they were buying it because they actually needed it. And uh, then after that, say, uh, 20, 2014, 2015 onwards, you had a period where the Chinese were going out to buy stuff because, well, it made more money than, than buying stuff at home. And I remember in, the, in, in you know, like maybe f f uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, I'd be trying to go to these Chinese companies and say, hey, come and invest in Thailand. You know, come and invest you know, in Southeast Asia. It's fantastic. And they'd say, what are the returns? I'd say, yeah, 15, 20%. Then, Why would I do that? I get 30% here staying at home. Why would I leave? So there's no need. Now, whatever they invest at home is like a good chance they'll lose money on. 
they look at coming out to Southeast Asia and getting like 8% return, they're like, I'll take it. And so now they're leaving because of this, you know, everything is saturated. There are 23 industrial sectors in, the, you know, they, they, they cut the industrial uh, uh, sector into 23 kind of like segments. And, and of the 23, 21 and over, oversupply. And uh, uh, by, by contrast, you come to Southeast Asia, uh, and it's it's there's so much to do here, you know, and uh, and so now that's kind of really what's taking the lead. And you'll see, you know, uh, projects. Some of them of, of the hundred hundred plus billion uh, outbound investment. I can I, I can venture to say that most of it is not, you know, strictly OBOR or you know, like I I can fail to see how buying the Waldorf Astoria or uh, or, or some kind of Italian uh, yacht. Uh, luxury yacht manufacturers in any way, about, n not to say that they won't try to, to kind of fit it into the OBOR, but it's not really OBOR. Uh, and, and you'll see a lot of that. Uh, and you'll also see some, some, some uh, investments which, which very conveniently fit into OBOR, which will, you know, which will um, make, make the whole uh, story so much better and, 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 and great. Uh, this outbound investment wave would have happened without this policy and, and which makes this policy a great policy because uh, you know, it's really just catching what would have happened uh, anyway and helping it and assisting it. And, and it's also important to understand that they're not just assisting state-owned enterprises. The Chinese in their uh, kind of macro-industrial policy, not just internationally, also domestically, uh, is very clear. You know, identify national champions, give them the market, and support them in any way possible, and be it be it uh, uh, you know state owned or private, like all these internet companies, you know uh, Alibaba, um, Tencent, uh, Baidu. These are not these are not state owned companies. Huawei. These are not state owned companies, but they're being supported as if they were state owned companies, and uh, because you know the state will protect its market for it, block out you know Facebook, block out Line, block out all these other guys in order to help it nurture these domestic companies. Same thing in, 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 uh, internationally. And it's very uh, important to understand that. I mean, and, 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 and why not? Good for them. You know, if you look at the, the, the Amazon of China is JD.com, the Google of China is Baidu, the Facebook of China is, is, is uh, Weixin, Tencent. You know, uh, you know, you, you, you go to, to you know, the, the, the Cisco of China is, is Huawei. You go to India, the Google of India is Google, the, the Amazon of India is Amazon, the, the uh, Cisco of India is Cisco. You know, they, they have such a big market and they, they didn't protect it. And the Chinese are doing it and they will do that abroad. So you'll see a lot of support for private enterprises going abroad uh, and, you know, getting a lot of state uh, backed support. Um, in the light of all that, uh, I think the GMS region is going to be a fantastic uh, source for projects uh, in this whole OBOR, uh, AIB kind of um, new you know, kind of ecosystem. Uh, for one, it has highly complementary uh, uh, economies, big, you know, 200 plus million people, uh, a beautiful uh, population curve, a lot of young people. Um, just not in Thailand. Uh, also, uh, low unemployment, and then you add to that the catalyst of the Chinese kind of money, and, and it's, it's, it, it, we're, we're, gonna, we're living in the middle of an exciting uh, region over the next uh, decade or two. Uh, I'd like to, you know, you touched on many of the drivers of the AIB uh, being founded in, in your speech just now, and you know, the clout, excess capacity, the frustration, uh, in your report, you also mentioned RMB internationalization, uh, and that is a big driver. But also, there's another one. It, it is a, a transformer of, uh, you know, basically tr U.S. Treasury bonds uh, into you know real usable infrastructure. You know, and it's the you know to answer the question about is this only a mere hundred billion? Of course, it's not a mere hundred billion. The 100 billion is the capital. They're going to be raising debt on the back of that. And essentially, they've created a machine which turns AA rated debt into AAA rated debt. And that is going to allow them 
to compete with the Japanese. Because the Chinese have always missed out on that bit. Uh, where they, they, I mean, on the railway, I mean, they, they, they were losing money on the loan to Thailand, whereas the Japanese were making money on their loan to Thailand, and that is a point which kind of just got lost in the in the noise, and they were willing to lose money on that loan. Ja Japan would give Thailand credit and make money on the loan, you see, and so and so the Chinese had a very big uh, disadvantage in terms of funding costs, which they can now overcome with this AIB. Um, and I think just because there's an ulterior motive to the whole thing doesn't mean it won't do a lot of good. And I think from, from our perspective, sure, they, they might be, and, and, you know, they might be wanting to, to, to have their Chinese companies, you know, have more projects. They're great. I mean, they're not, they're good companies, right? And they're good companies which often are unfairly uh, um, blocked out of markets. In, in, in favor of you know local protectionists or, or other kind of uh, more bigger kind of you know, places where the you know you have maybe the Japanese who've been here for much longer and they, they basically have a have their way in and the Chinese are being kept out and and th if they can through this at at the very least level the playing field and maybe even give themselves a bit of an advantage well so be it um, and and uh, I think you also mentioned a point about lowering standards which which. Yes, there, there may be that risk, but also it, it, it's important, and I think Luz touched on that, that you know, World Bank, a, ADB, are not beacons of excellence either. And on the one hand, you might be lowering certain standards, but on the other hand, you might be actually improving operations. And it's, it's just not, from a, from a, at least from a private sector person, to look at the way these organizations are run. It, that's not how you run organizations. And, and if you know, AIB can, can just provide a little bit of uh, competition on that front, excellent. Um, I think my, my final point would be uh, that, uh, you know, on the point of, you know, trying to understand, like, the ulterior motives and the conf sometimes the confusing messages coming from the, the Chinese about what it is that they, 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 they intend to do, I think it's important to understand three things. The first is that uh, uh, actually foreign policy in China isn't particularly high on their uh, agenda, you know. If you look at, and one easy way to look at that is the Politburo lineup. You know, in America, Secretary of State is number three. Uh, in China, foreign minister doesn't even make it to the Politburo. Now, if you say forget foreign minister, the foreign affairs supremo, which is a state councilor in charge of foreign affairs, even he's not on the Politburo. Um, but you know who is on the Politburo? Head of the trade unions. And so that gives you an idea of really where, what is it that the Chinese are worrying about and thinking about all, the, all day, every day. It's really not having a consistent kind of policy on, on, on this, that, or other. Uh, and you know, AIB in terms of the, kind of like the, the uh, administrative weight and rankings of, of uh, you know, including Mr. Jin and all that, is not, it's not particularly high in the whole, you know, it's very far off Politburo. They didn't put a Politburo member to run the AIB. No, and actually a good thing, by the way. Um, so that's that's the first point: is that it's uh, you know not particularly high on their on their you know it doesn't get a, a huge uh, mind share. Secondly, is uh, you have a lot of conflicting agenda. Uh, about six months ago, I was uh, setting up a what would be squarely and beautifully OBOR kind of project. And uh, halfway through there, oh, sorry, there's a change of policy. Now uh, NDRC no longer approves any of these policies. I was like, oh, interesting. But but said, oh, yeah, but that's a different organization. It's a different entity in us. I mean, the, a lot of these Chinese uh, organs have conflicting agenda. And uh, you know, on the one hand, you want to promote OBOR. On the other hand, they want to avoid RMB uh, outflows. So and you have, and then in, and there are about seven different you know, agenda at any, given any problem and, and run by seven different ministries or bodies who don't speak to each other and often compete with each other. So it, it's not surprising uh, that you will have conflicting messages coming out through that. And finally, uh, not to be underestimated is the lack of skill in dealing with international kind of matters. A lot of these companies were 
99% of the revenues, you know, as recently as 10 years ago, would have been, or even five years ago, would have been domestic. Uh, these um, uh, uh, kind of uh, sometimes state officials, sometimes uh, state-owned enterprise officials coming out here, they don't have a lot of experience uh, overseas. Uh, and they, they've never negotiated a, a, a share transfer agreement in, in, in English. They've never seen, uh, you know, even things like when to sign non-disclosure agreements and things. They're not very good yet at that. And the, the, the people who have a lot of international experience are not out here yet. And, uh, and so, so that is another factor impacting the, what, what would seem to be you know, confusing messages. Well, it, not necessarily. They, they're still in the, in the stage of getting, gaining this experience. That'll be it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So they're in the, um, they operate in, in a thick of globalization, but not being adequately globalized sometimes on the one hand. Foreign policy, not high on the domestic agenda is common uh, in other countries as well, but it's worth bringing out. Uh, and then to, uh, you know, conflicting agendas, uh, interagency conflicts. I think the point that, uh, there are two points I want to tease out at this time. One from uh, Mark's presentation, you know, this, this link that we overlook uh, you think that the U.S. had this Obama pivot rebalance, big deal over the two administrations. But in fact, all these OBO, uh, various uh, Chinese NDB, um, AIB, were reactions to the, the, partly reactions to the pivot rebalance. So the pushback was very strong, while the original pivot rebalance became weak. There's an ironic twist. Um, and from uh, Joe Horn's point, uh, you know, this, we think that AIB is about mobilizing China's FDI, OFDI, but in fact, OFDI had been ongoing already, and the AIB is actually capitalizing on what was happening already. Uh, so it's the other way, it's the other way around. Let me come now to uh, uh, Jim Stent, uh, Mr. James Stent, uh, uh, we know him as Jim, and. Uh, uh, Jim has a, had a career in banking uh, with the Bank of Asia in, in Thailand, but then of course uh, became very international, just finished a two-week trekking in China, speaks like Joe, um, speaks Chinese, uh, spends time in China, Thailand, the United States, and uh, he's, his bio is with you, but uh, in addition to the bio, uh, he has a book coming out next month, and uh, since he's a good friend, I will advertise a lot of it now. Uh, this is a book published by Oxford University Press, so it's not, uh, it's not a small time book. Uh, Oxford University Press, November 2016, available on Amazon. Uh, the author is Jim Stent, James Stent, and the title of the book is called China's Banking Transformation. Now, you cannot write a book on China's banking transformation published by Oxford University Press without knowing a thing or two about it. So, um, Jim, the floor is yours, 10, 15 minutes. One of the problems of being third in the lineup is that uh, much of what I have prepared has already been said by uh, Luis and Joe, uh, but I will repeat it because it affirms uh, what they have already said. Now, uh, within this uh, 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 tectonic shift in the landscape of uh, geostrategy in Asia that uh, uh, John Titinan talked about at the very beginning. I think AIIB plays a, a, a role uh, that it is important we understand. And I'm going to start my remarks by saying, making a few predictions about AIIB and then explaining a little bit about how the Chinese do things um, in ways that are very different from the ways that they might be done in the West. And this stems out of their uh, own cultural backgrounds and also the way the Chinese political economy works and the role of the Communist Party in China. And if one doesn't understand these things, uh, then one can misgauge what is likely to happen. Now, uh, Mark, in his outstanding report, uh, he mentioned that it's already out of date. And that's true of anything one says about China in one sense, 
because change is uh, proceeding at such a rapid rate. But at the same time, there are enormous continuities in what happens in China. And these, uh, if one understands the continuities, if, they under if one understands how China goes about doing things, one can have a better sense of what is likely to happen. So I would venture to say that although uh, AIIB is just beginning and has only uh, launched a very small number of projects, I personally am rather optimistic, echoing what Joe said, that it may do some very, very uh, good uh, work in this part of the world. I think that, uh, yes, China doesn't have a, uh, does not accord extraordinary independent importance to foreign policy per se, but I think that's because foreign policy in China is part of a larger national uh, strategy which Xi Jinping articulates the rejuvenation of China, the China dream, et cetera. Foreign policy is not something independent as it perhaps is in the US. Uh, instead, it is simply incorporated in as a part of uh, uh, China's overall national strategy for achieving the wealth and power that it feels it deserves. Now, in uh, the time of Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, uh, the role of foreign policy was uh, quite low on the totem pole. Um, today, as Mark has said, China is becoming much more assertive internationally. And that assertion is, in fact, part of China's rejuvenation policy. So AIIB is a very prominent part of China's new assertiveness. Uh, there are, as Mark has mentioned, there are several reasons, motivations for establishing it, and several objectives that the Chinese intend to accomplish. But the, the China knows that its, its global image, its regional image, is very much on the line in making AIIB work well and avoiding uh, major blunders. Therefore, they've put some of their best and brightest resources behind planning it and establishing it. Jinny Chun, the uh, CEO, from what I understand, is an outstanding and very sophisticated person. But don't forget, he's also a member of the Chinese Communist Party. So he will uh, fit into what China's plans uh, are. Uh, his uh, first assignment overseas was in ADB in the 1980s. His then superior was a Thai who's now retired from ADP and has told me that he was a simply outstanding young professional in ADP at that time. Uh, the Ministry of Finance is charged with uh, a lot of the work for getting, or most of the work, for getting AIIB underway. And the Ministry of Finance, I know from my 13 years of serving on boards of Chinese banks, has some exceptionally bright, competent, and uh, diligent people. So they're putting their best and their brightest into it. There are a few things, though, uh, that have been raised in terms of transparency, slowness to move forward, et cetera, which are, I think, all very legitimate uh, concerns uh, that are stressed in Mark's report and also in the remarks that uh, Luis has made. So I think uh, here, some of the things that I learned about how Chinese commercial banking works in the course of researching and writing my own book, uh, I think they apply uh, as we look at how China is likely to develop AIIB. First thing I'd like to say is, uh, is to respond to Ajahn Titinan's question of, is there a grand strategy? Well, yes and no. Uh, there is general direction which is rejuvenation of China. It is the recovery of wealth and power. But the details of how that will work will only gradually be unveiled and probably not really known to the leaders themselves because hallmarks of Chinese strategy are pragmatism, what Deng Xiaoping called crossing the river by feeling the stones. In other words, take a step at a time, see what happens. If it works, do it. If it doesn't work, scrap it. To do this, they often will announce a grand policy and then nothing happens for a while. And then you begin to see a few small pilots 
start in remote regions of the country. They want to see how it works in a small area. This is typical of everything that China undertakes, with a very few exceptions. The exceptions come when there's something where the leadership says, we've got to move fast right now, as they did with the 4 trillion yuan stimulus during the crisis in 2008. If they have to, they can mobilize the entire country very fast in pursuit, single-minded pursuit of a single goal. But it's not the normal style. Normally, it's proceed slowly, step by step. We can see that happening in AIIB. Chinese don't believe in big bangs. Big bang and you fall bang in your face. So make a loan to a friendly country like Pakistan, Bangladesh, places like this. Gain a little experience, get your staff in order. Announce as few policies as you can get away with. Find out what the details should be as you move slowly forward. So Luis, don't be too discouraged by the lack of detail in the strategies. Uh, keep pushing. <laughs> and probably it'll gradually be unveiled. Uh, bearing in mind also that there's nothing in Chinese culture for 2,000 years, nor in the style of the Communist Party, that is favorable towards transparency. Uh, so this is a new thing for them. Uh, but to be fair to them, the U.S. Freedom of Information Act is only how many years old? Not so terribly far back. We weren't always that transparent either. So um, I think give them a bit of a benefit of the doubt, recognize they're working out the details. They probably don't know the answers to a lot of questions, but keep up the pressure. Um, China is extraordinarily good also at learning. It's like a sponge. Why did I sit on the board of Chinese banks when I was the only foreigner and the only non-member of the Communist Party on the board? Simply because they thought from my banking experience I probably knew something they could learn from. And Indeed, they told me, so long as you keep criticizing and challenging, you're useful on the board. The minute you just agree with us, you're useless. So I uh, kept criticizing. Um, the, another aspect to consider here is that China is surprisingly averse to risk. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't realize this from reading the Financial Times reports on the Chinese banking sector. But in my experience on the boards, after the debacle of the collapse, effective collapse of the Chinese banking system in the 1990s, the mandate from the Politburo, from the State Council, to Chinese uh, banks was, don't lose money, avoid risk. And I think that will, that will carry through. Joe mentioned that the Chinese banks, unlike the uh, Japanese banks, they want to earn money on their loans. Uh, and I think AIIB will be relatively uh, cautious in the risks it assumes as well. Um, so bearing all of that in mind, don't expect all of a sudden AIIB is going to suddenly grow extremely fast. It will grow bit by bit. One of the mistakes Western pundits make in looking at China is they think when something is announced, well, two years has passed. We don't see the evidence of it happening yet. Sometimes these things take five, eight years to unfold. The outlines of the Chinese commercial banking reform were unveiled in the third plenum of the Communist Party in 1993. It was only in the late 1990s that uh, Zhu Rongji, then Prime Minister, got serious about implementing them. But when they implement them, they do it. Whatever the Chinese decide to announce probably is something they've discussed internally, debated extensively for two, three years, and have reached some high-level consensus on before they announce it. Then they will implement it. But there may be a myriad of details to work out. There may be vested interests to cope with, etc. cetera. Uh, Joe alluded to uh, different conflicting points of view in different organizations in China that are all given their say. Indeed, when a decision is finally made, people were supposed to get behind it. But prior to that, the degree of policy debate that occurs in China is very high and often very public, too, as they solicit input. Uh, I've obviously never had a chance to meet anybody in the State Council, 
but I've met economists who have presented to the State Council, and they tell me a whole range of different viewpoints uh, are presented. And I asked, well, how, how is the final decision made? And perhaps uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek, the response was, whoever makes the last presentation gets the final word. Whether that's true or not, I, I doubt. Um, so I'm basically optimistic. I share uh, uh, the point of view of, of uh, Joe and also Ajahn Titinan that uh, competition with the World Bank and the ADB is good. And so I'd just like to say a few words uh, to supplement what Luis has already said about some of our existing multilateral uh, uh, institutions and the uh, sustainability uh, and good governance of their initiatives. Uh, first, I think the U.S. opposition to uh, uh, countries joining a AIIB uh, based upon concerns about good governance, it was a smokescreen and it was a colossal blunder on the part of the United States. But I think in general, the West uh, all of us uh, must be very careful in adopting a preaching, superior, and condescending attitude towards China as though we had all the answers. We don't. Uh, just to take, for example, the World Bank. I think Luis has already said enough about ADB, but the World Bank. First big corporate governance problem is massive. The total underrepresentation of certain countries in uh, the governance of those institutions. That's bad governance on a global scale. Second of all, the bloated bureaucracy that Mark talks about there, efficiency is part of good governance, and they are not very efficient organizations. I suspect uh, Jin Lee Chun, from his time in ADB, probably experienced massive frustration with the, with the bureaucracy there and doesn't intend to duplicate it. Uh, lastly, right here in Thailand, we have the case in the 1990s of the Bak Mung Dam and the displacement of 20,000 people there, destruction of their fishing livelihoods, etc. Uh, so I think uh, Western institutions, they're getting better, but they have a long way to go. I'm a member of a San Francisco-based organization called Rainforest Action Network, and it is constantly attacking U.S., uh, the World Bank, but also U.S. commercial banks right up to today for their shoddy environmental uh, practices and supporting of projects that displace people. So um, I think uh, the problems that uh, Mark is discussing in his report are problems that are common to all of us, not just AIIB. And uh, I hope that, uh, I, I think that civil society uh, needs to keep up the pressure, but I think it needs to find, particularly in the case of China, it needs to understand China very well uh, including how the Chinese go about doing things so that it can find a way of engaging with institutions like AIIB. So um, with those remarks, thank you very much.